Hi there, welcome to the 11th week of our course Elements of Literature and Creative Communication. Well, we began this week with uh, an interesting book and more than that with an interesting philosopher Aristotle and we understood uh, you know at least to a certain extent we you know we acquainted ourselves with uh, uh, the genius called Aristotle and his expertise in various fields and therefore how he qualifies to be a true polymath. And uh, in his works on uh, you know especially in his work on drama which we identified as uh, you know uh, poetics, we see Aristotle classifying uh, you know a drama based on its various elements. In fact, more than that of course, he identifies the two broad genres of drama as tragedy and comedy and uh, he defines them uh, uh, briefly and uh, he goes on to uh, give us a structural understanding of uh, Greek tragedy especially in terms of its six elements. So, we discussed all that in uh, the last class. Uh, during that uh, discussion, I said that you know Aristotle's uh, discourse on tragedy is based on his uh, familiarity with uh, uh, the Greek drama especially written by Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides and of course, Aristophanes. Right? So, in this class we are going to take up uh, a closer look at western drama or origins of western drama of course, for want of time and as I mean more than that of course, uh, since it is an introductory class uh, you know more than a brief history of western drama you can call it a kind of a snapshot of western drama. Okay? Well, ideally we should have begun this week with uh, a snapshot of western drama and then come to Aristotle's poetics. But I deliberately uh, you know uh, reverse the sequence because of course, we learned this uh, technique called foreshadowing right. What does uh, foreshadowing do? In fact, it piques your interest by discussing briefly you know what is uh, ahead it, it piques the interest of the reader. Similarly, you know by deliberately introducing you to a theoretical work that is based on you know the plays of uh, uh, all these masters. I thought you know you would be more interested to know about these uh, Greek masters in fact, who play a major role in founding an entire uh, European tradition of drama western tradition of drama. Okay? So, let us uh, go ahead and take a look at uh, the origins you know how did exactly uh, this western European drama begin. Of course, it has its beginnings like uh, ancient poetry it has its beginnings in liturgical tradition various uh, religious uh, traditions. So, approximately speaking uh, you know in 600 BC uh, drama began as uh, some kind of performance a poetic performance to please the god of wine fertility and vegetation called Dionysus. In other words drama is uh, a genre of literature that is basically dedicated to the god of wine fertility and vegetation in the Greek context called Dionysus you know he is the patron god of drama you can call it. So, it began with uh, choral performances chorus we have already identified as a group of uh, you know uh, singers who play various roles who have an extraordinary role to uh, you know during their performance. So, uh, drama begins as a choral song you know dedicated to praise Dionysus and these choral songs were called diatrims. In other words you find the genesis of uh, you know western drama Greek drama in diatrims they were the primitive versions of uh, drama. Well, later of course, lot many additions went on happening to that and uh, what we call a full fledged drama has its genesis in diatram that is what we can know. Okay. Uh, the earliest performances were tragedies of course, remember uh, why were they called tragedies we again touched upon that right. In uh, Greek tragedies the root word is tragos that is goat maybe they were offered as a prize when there were competitions remember Athens conducted annually you know drama festival and all of them performed there whichever uh, playwright won the first prize was either offered goat as a prize or maybe goat referred to you know some kind of a sacrifice maybe to commemorate uh, Dionysus and all that you know to celebrate Dionysus. So, 
tragedy has its roots there. Now, let us go and see of course, uh, now out of diatrim emerges uh, you know full fledged plays, but what is the first step? What is the first step? Now, here is the first step from diatrim you have you know thespis in the you know like we identified N. Hedwana as the first known author in the history of uh, human literature. Thespis is the first known actor and dramatist in the history of uh, human drama especially western drama okay because when the 6th century BCE when there was competition when the, you know when for the first time Athens conducted a dramatic festival Thespis won the first prize you know he he marveled the audience by leaping out of the cart you know and then reciting poetry as if you know he was reciting you know the various characters uh, in a particular play they were uh, speaking he recited poetry of course he made use of masks in order to portray different characters you know so we identified right first of course you have choral songs which were called uh, diatrim and then you have one actor uh, joins uh, uh, the choral performances and this was the first actor who joined and uh, stretched the scope of drama to chorus plus one actor doing very many roles. Of course, he composed his own plays especially tragedies and began performing. So, we have the first actor in Thespis that is why today you know in order to refer to uh, a great actor we call that person you know a thespian right. A thespian means uh, an exemplary actor. Uh, you know uh, it is a word related to uh, drama and theatre uh, you could call an extraordinary actor a thespian of course, we have the roots in thespis. From thespis of course, uh, the nature of uh, the nature and scope of drama went on increasing you know there is no looking back because having seen thespis add one character then we have another genius called uh, you know Aeschylus who is actually the founder of western drama because now stretching the scope of drama from one actor to two actors he began composing uh, his tragedies. Therefore, most of the dramatic techniques that you and I find today in uh, you know that are prevalent even in contemporary drama well we owe a debt of gratitude to Aeschylus as such because as I said he brings in a lot of structural changes. Earlier, well, uh, chorus had something like you know 50 singers uh, almost reciting uh, various things. Now, for the first time, he realizes that you know chorus could be reduced, therefore, he reduces the number of singers in chorus from 50 to almost 12. And then the second is you know, apart from the first character which Thespis had introduced, Aeschylus introduces the second character. And of course, it is he who almost lays the foundation for you know the protagonist of the play to be of noble birth and having uh, some extraordinary qualities and uh, uh, a bit of a complex plot you know we discussed complex tragedies and simple tragedies in the previous class right. So, he was the one to add lot many twists to the plots and all that therefore, you can call Aeschylus the founder of the aesthetic drama you know and his influence spread for more than 2000 years even to this day we owe a debt of gratitude to Aeschylus as such. More than that he introduced uh, you know what can be called a vertical scale of drama you know when we say a vertical scale of drama of course, it has got to do with uh, uh, the structure of stage in fact, he designed the stage in such that you know there are, there is a three tier imagine the stage as having uh, you know stage is an area where uh, you know actors perform you know that well. So, it is a three tier stage on the first tier above the pedestal you have you know seats of gods obviously, uh, Greek drama made use of uh, various gods including Dionysius, Zeus many other gods come and go ok. So, whenever a character that is to depict God well it comes on stage they usually would go and sit on the pedestal. So, indicate to indicate uh, reverence ok. So, that is a divine seat and just below down below you know first day the entire tree is you know it is a place of exile and punishment. So, you can call it something like you know and the middle place as where you know it is a fair circle of earth where the human characters human characters come and act 
they roll you know something like this. Now, think of it as some kind of you know the middle stage as earth where human mortals are there and the down stage the down stage the down below is a pit you know where you know if a character has been cursed and is exiled as a mode of punishment they are made to go stand there or sit there and perform their role something like this and there are gods on the above. So, something like you know you have uh, you know Swarga, Naraka and of course, the Bhumi in between something like that you know the uh, netherworld, the earth is where human beings live and of course, uh, on the uh, you know uh, Olympian uh, hills you have gods maybe to structure that it is called a vertical scale in drama and later in the hands of contemporary playwrights this vertical scale undergoes lot of transformation. Aeschylus uh, wrote several plays several tragedies especially unfortunately we do not have uh, you know it said about 30 of them more than 30 plays he seemed to have written uh, and uh, we have so far you know uh, 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 about 7 surviving tragedies that are attributed to Aeschylus. And the greatness of Aeschylus is also this that he created what can be called you know uh, a, a dramatic cycle. So, you know uh, a couple of plays joined together by a common thread right uh, an extraordinary technique you know. So, the especially the Oresteia trilogy that consists of uh, Agamemnon, the libation bearers and of course, the Eumenides you know these are the three uh, 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 cycles of play you know related to one particular theme the Oresteia trilogy. So, for the first time he introduces this and uh, that is also another major structural change. And you have the first play is the Persians by Aeschylus uh, composed in 472 BC and followed by the suppliants and uh, you have Prometheus bound written in 410 BC you know these are some of uh, the surviving tragedies especially his work Agamemnon and of course, the Eumenides they are widely read plays by Aeschylus. From Aeschylus let us go to uh, another important uh, figure in fact, is Sophocles. Well, in terms of quality in terms of uh, you know adding beauty and elegance to drama well that credit goes to Sophocles you know Sophocles by far you know by, I mean is considered the best of the dramatists you know the best of the dramatists especially in the Greek context. So, uh, and of course, is also considered the better of the three tragedians by contemporary ones in fact, earlier. Uh, Aeschylus had occupied that role during the classical Greek period, but the contemporary scholarship you know considers Sophocles as uh, you know the best of the three something like this. Again uh, very interestingly or, a stra as, or as a you know strange coincidence he seemed to have authored more than 120 plays however, only 7 plays are available you know like Aeschylus plays which are you know only 7 of them are available even Sophocles we have just 7 of uh, his plays available to us and of them Oedipus the king is an extraordinary work. In fact, this particular work uh, is also credited to have uh, you know uh, is also uh, you know significant because it is uh, you know it has uh, opened a new school of uh, thought in psychology especially you know Sigmund Freud and all modern psychology has its genesis in this particular play Oedipus the king you have the Oedipus complex and later Electra complex and other complexes you know Freud think of Sigmund Freud, Jung and others well they have their roots in this particular play the Oedipus the king an exemplary in fact, one of the best tragedies that you can ever uh, come face to face with Oedipus the king you know. And uh, again uh, here uh, like uh, Aeschylus added the second character Sophocles adds the third character and makes uh, you know uh, characters you know the strength to 3 and uh, maybe gradually you know that is how you have as many characters as you uh, can see in today's uh, you know drama. So, that is that's his two that is to Sophocles credit adding the third character again some of his uh, well known plays include Antigone uh, a remarkable play again you know uh, almost as back as uh, 5th century imagine you know it talks of uh, a conflict between an individual and state you know the 
the contemporary postmodern subject, you know, contemporary subject, a conflict between an individual and the state, and how sometimes an individual prevails over the state because though state is majoritarian, an individual is uh, solitary, how the sanity of an individual can prevail over the state albeit a little late though you know. So, it is a tragedy of course, so that uh, prevalence happens a little later Antigone an extraordinary play Electra, Oedipus at Colonus these are some of his remarkable plays ok Sophocles. We have the third uh, greatest uh, Hellenic uh, you know classical Greek playwright Euripides. So, together Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides are called the Trimurtis or the triumvirate of uh, classical Greek drama. Uh, well, of course, he was not as well known as uh, uh, the previous two uh, uh, playwrights during his lifetime. However, uh, later scholarship also attributes uh, some greatness to his uh, you know plays. And uh, in fact, uh, his greatness, the greatness of Euripides is that he introduced the element of comedy into his tragedy and therefore, inaugurating a new genre of uh, you know drama called tragic comedy. Therefore, you have a trailblazer in Euripides because he introduced the tragic comedy in his plays. Some of his uh, well known plays are media uh, again an extraordinary play and in fact, it is also said that uh, contemporary feminism is born out of this particular play you know media talks of uh, autonomy of the female agency and how she renounces the very concept of family and finds you know when she is dejected in love in marriage and all that how she seeks out you know revenge even on her own uh, husband and all that you know an exemplary play. So, therefore, you can say that contemporary feminism is also born out of this particular play media and again he also writes Electra frozen women these are some of his uh, works. Of course, some of these themes find uh, repetition in subsequent uh, playwrights you know. Uh, so, this is Euripides for us. From here we go to the first known uh, you know comedy uh, playwright called Aristophanes. We have already discussed Aristophanes and how comedy was born because uh, during uh, the classical times the populace was divided between uh, you know the greatness of Aeschylus and of course, Euripides and uh, Aristophanes was uh, slightly you know he was uh, you know uh, he did not see eye to eye with Euripides therefore, satirizing uh, the pseudo uh, you know significance of Euripides he composes frogs. So, uh, that is one of his plays you know the wasps, the birds, the frogs these are some of his uh, very well known and uh, most loved plays you know. Uh, that is why you have Euripides and so you know. So, these are some things that we can keep in mind. So, you can call again you have a trailblazer in Aristophanes because he can be called the father of comedy. So, these four figures play a major role in founding western drama or European drama as we know it which later of course, has a significant influence on uh, Roman uh, uh, drama and theatre tradition and of course, uh, even in other parts of uh, you know the globe as well. So, this is these four are very important uh, people as far as Greek drama is concerned as far as you know the European drama is concerned. From here let us go to you know Roman uh, yeah uh, drama, but before that you know this is actually an image of Greek amphitheatre. Now, look at it of course, you can see the stage there and look how beautifully it is covered it is a it is a it is a uh, this type of theatre is called amphitheatre, we have known that and of course, here the audience is surrounded on all three sides therefore, a kind of a thrust stage, but built in a grand scale look at the background there you know this is where most of the uh, tragedies that you and I have read or are going to read happened were performed you know they have beautiful image of that you can understand the grandeur of the stage by looking at it you know amphitheatre and our contemporary concept of uh, theatres is born out of these kind of amphitheater, amphitheaters ok. Yeah, from Greek plays let us go to you know ancient Roman drama. Uh, uh, well, of course, uh, not as uh, significantly as Greece Rome also worshipped uh, drama, but uh, Rome's preoccupation uh, was uh, somewhere else. In fact, uh, remember the moment you think of uh, you know Rome you think of uh, gladiators boxers, moxie wars and all that. Therefore, you know the Roman populace uh, 
preferred all these things over theater. Therefore, you do not find any significant contribution, not as significant as the Greek, uh, you know, uh, drama. Nevertheless, uh, because of its extraordinary architectural architectural grandeur, you know, something like massive amphitheaters such as Rome's Colosseum, uh, you know, which were basically built uh, to demonstrate uh, Rome's power and architectural grandeur. Uh, you find some, uh, some, you know, some remnants of uh, classical drama even here, especially you have Seneca, you know, who was greatly influenced by these four uh, great playwrights, Greek playwrights, therefore, uh, modeled after uh, them, he also writes tragedies. So, you know them, you know, Seneca and tragedies and all that. So, these, uh, uh, you know, after Seneca, of course, Rome primarily uh, prioritized something like a performance of mimes and pantomimes. The contemporary mimes and pantomimes have their genesis in Rome. So, this is something that we can keep in mind, especially Rome's uh, contribution to uh, the theatres, you know, amph amphitheatres, uh, Rome's Colosseum and all that. Seneca is an important classical Roman playwright, a very significant name. Okay. From here, uh, yeah, this is the remains of a legendary uh, Colosseum in Rome. That is something that we can, uh, you know, keep in mind, right? Yeah. From here, uh, let us go to medieval English drama and the morality plays. Uh, remember, uh, so we are skipping almost uh, about uh, 2000 years compared, I mean, uh, more or less, you know, we have come to the middle. Uh, medieval English drama, something so early 16th century, you know, late 15th century, early 16th century, where, you know, drama, it said that drama in England, uh, you know, though has its uh, roots, though is influenced by Greek and Roman uh, drama, developed uh, in a different direction. Of course, you can spot the influences, nevertheless, it is also known for its deviations from the Greek drama, you know. Again, uh, like the Greek drama, you also find uh, origins of drama in England in its liturgical traditions. Therefore, to a certain extent, you find, uh, you know, influence of church, influence of the Bible on this. Therefore, you find a lot of biblical plays, you know, uh, not biblical plays, plays around Bible and all that. So, uh, based on uh, the readings of Bible, of course, that is when, re Im, uh, I mean, uh, remember, uh, I mean, King James uh, Bible had just come out at that at that point of time or maybe was in the offing something like that so therefore you have the morality plays that were meant to enlighten the you know elite and the laity alike you know so laity is common mass elite is uh, you know them you know uh, so uh, morality plays held their sway over both the commoners and of course the aristocrats alike so, typically, uh, some of the well known themes in these uh, morality plays. Everyman was one such play, a very remarkable play, you know, where you find uh, a playing of good versus evil and uh, pride versus humility and all that, and virtues versus vices, where virtue, after undergoing a lot of suffering and all that, wins finally, you know. So, uh, Everyman is one of the exemplary morality plays. So, this is something that can be kept in mind. Well, from here, we move on to what can be called the golden period in, uh, you know, especially European drama or especially uh, in England, you know, the golden period. This is called, uh, you know, uh, uh, Elizabethan stage. But before we come that maybe uh, some more points about mystery and miracle plays. Uh, remember, we said that, you know, these plays have their tradition in liturgical traditions. Therefore, they were basically performed during, uh, you know, several pageants, uh, especially Christian fest festivals such as, uh, you know, Easter and Christmas and all that. And they were also part of uh, certain commentary cycles. They were performed uh, there. Therefore, you can also call them just cycles, commentary cycles, where, you know, morality plays uh, seen. These plays also showed, again, uh, like all morality plays, you find good fighting, uh, I mean, evil and finally, though evil tries to prevail over good in the beginning towards the end, good prevails, you know, a kind of uh, uh, a common structure that you find across all these miracle plays, all right. Now, th having discussed uh, miracle plays, let us go to 
what is uh, generally called the golden period of English drama because here comes uh, Shakespeare. As I said in the world of drama, Shakespeare is uh, an uncrowned king okay, for various reasons, for various reasons and rightfully of course, is called the crown, the crown king or uh, something like this. It was influenced definitely by Greek drama uh, and of course, uh, Roman drama and also by the morality plays that were developed back in the uh, you know ground. So, you find that kind of spiritual conflict even in the Elizabethan uh, plays. Just before Shakespeare began writing or before his arrival onto the stage, you know you have uh, university wits, they were called university wits, they uh, you know began writing plays and prominent among them was Christopher Marlowe. And we have Faustus, you know based on Goethe's Faust, you find uh, uh, of course, Goethe bases uh, his Faust on Marlowe of course, uh, you know. So, you have Faustus, uh, you know uh, the theme of uh, Faust is very familiar to us, he is an extraordinary scholar, but uh, he is not very happy. In fact, uh, Faust is the first great hero that you can find because he wages a war against uh, gods because he wants to know more. He is a true bibliophile, you know he wants more. So, he wants to expand the scope of uh, knowledge and though he has been warned that probably there is a reason why God must have put limitation on our ability to understand. He does not believe in that, he creates a pact with the devil and wants to know more and uh, that is the because of that hubris he sees a great fall. Marlowe discusses all that in Faustus an extraordinary play. Of course, you can find shades of morality play there nevertheless uh, you know an, an exemplary tragedy. Yeah, from here comes uh, I mean you know uh, Shakespeare during this background. Shakespeare is a remarkable playwright, we discussed Shakespeare during our discussion of sonnets right. And as I said you know even I mean Shakespeare is an ingenious playwright, an extraordinary playwright and that is why one of his later contemporaries Ben Jonson you know who is a successor to the legacy of Shakespeare says that Shakespeare is not actually of a particular age because when we read a writer or when we uh, uh, watch the performance of a playwright or a dramatist, they are just for maybe that particular period or maybe for an age, but uh, Shakespeare is not for an age, but for all time you know highlighting the, cla the classic nature of his uh, writing and how it is uh, you know it is a, a canonical work something like that. And it is to the credit of Shakespeare that he almost uh, you know practiced in all genres, sub genres of uh, drama, he wrote exemplary comedies, extraordinary tragedies and of course, beautiful tragic comedies, beautiful history plays all of them. Uh, of course, there is again a kind of a, a dispute as far as the number of uh, plays are concerned, but generally they say about 40. So, to be precise 37 plays, but uh, that, that I mean so far we have about 37 plays out of which 17 are said to be comedies, 10 history plays and 10 tragedies. You have uh, heard of his well known uh, tragedies such as Macbeth, Hamlet, King Lear and Othello remarkable uh, tragedies in their own right. And when it comes to comedies you have a Mid Midsummer Night's Dream, Much Ado About Nothing, Twelfth Night and all that. In tragic comedy we have already discussed uh, you know uh, uh, what is it a Merchant of Venice is a, is a best example for tragic comedies and in history you have uh, you know Julius Caesar and other well known plays in history. Uh, well, Shakespeare is an untutored genius because he did not have any university education as that probably all that he had was a basic uh, education something like uh, class 7, class 8 or 10 something like that you know. Uh, very So, he was an untutored genius. All that he could read and borrow was you know unlike uh, uh, Christopher Marlowe and others who had access to Greek and Latin, he, he did not have access to direct access to the plays of all those dramatists. All that he had access was through the histories written by Ptolemy you know and of course, uh, Hollinshed's uh, chronicles and he borrowed uh, uh, his 
plots from there and uh, you know and constructed beautiful plots around them and created extraordinary plays that the world marvels even to this day you know so these are some things that can be kept in mind and his contribution to english literature too is very very immense remember he single handedly seemed to have contributed more than 2000 words and inflections to english language that's the that's a very brief uh, you know uh, snapshot into the genius called shakespeare but afterwards uh, you know uh, well there was a period of lull after shakespeare's time though ben johnson began writing again there was a ban on drama and uh, by the time it was lifted in 17th century it was almost you know drama the had almost moved away from its days of glory therefore you have some kind of parodies uh, such as comedy of humor comedy of uh, you know manners especially in the the writings of ben johnson especially think of walpone you have john marston and george chapman and when it comes to comedy of manners you have two well known writers you know william congreve and sheridan so comedy of manners school of scandal and all that you must have heard of it and then when it comes to 18th century not much of uh, you know production you have very minor playwrights in uh, joseph addison oliver goldsmith and others and of course when it comes to uh, slightly later uh, maybe when you slightly go out of uh, england and look at europe you find uh, you know goethe of course a major figure in uh, uh, dr faust and all that so this is uh, in general western play and european drama western drama and of course drama in england uh, yeah uh, probably in the next class what we can uh, think of is some wonderful uh, uh, you know uh, modern uh, drama you know an overview of modern drama therefore you can call this class a beautiful rap i hope you enjoyed uh, this uh, snapshot or peek view into uh, western drama especially classical greek drama and its influence on roman drama and of course proper elizabethan drama all right let's uh, discuss modern drama in the next class okay thank you